Well, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Peter Stevenson. I'm a storyteller, filmmaker, book illustrator and writer. I live here on the west coast of Wales in the county of Ceredigion um, in a town called Aberystwyth, looking west. And um, I'll introduce you two to Jacob Whitaker. Hi, I'm Jacob Whitaker. Um, I'm an artist and a filmmaker in West Wales as well. I live at the other end of the county to Peter, um, but we've been working together for about maybe seven or eight years now. Um, and we've found a really interesting sort of, yeah, some, some mutual interests to explore. So um, I think we're going to discuss that with you tonight. Um, and I'll pass you over to Terry, who's uh, hosting us this evening. Thank you, Jacob and Peter. Uh, my name is Terry Jones. I'm a member of the Seneca Nation of Indians. Uh, we're located about 30 miles south of uh, Niagara Falls here on Turtle Island. Um, I've, I'm also a strategic advisor for um, Native Spirit Festival uh, as a filmmaker, uh, cultural uh, presenter. Um, a lot of my short films have uh, screened throughout the world. Uh, more or less, uh, my storytelling and my films uh, entertain and educate audiences about um, historical and contemporary uh, Indigenous uh, people, and particularly my tribe, the Seneca um, or the Haudenosaunee, uh, which uh, people might be more familiar with the term Iroquois, um, but we've sort of reclaimed our of how we're being referred to as Haudenosaunee, which includes all the uh, Six Nations uh, of the Iroquois Confederacy. So thank you. So we're um, here today to mostly to talk about um, uh, your uh, Jacob's and Peter's film, uh, Fairy Tale of Water. I'm not even going to try to attempt to say it in, in uh, Welsh. Um, I'll do it for you. It's Chwetl Dur. Chwetl Dur. I won't even try. <laughs> so uh, um, so the, the idea came about was, because um, as I said, I'm a strategic advisor. I work with Tweet, or I consult with Tweet. And uh, she had talked about your film and she had um, uh, she kind of put uh, two things together with because um, your your story is about uh, tales of storytelling of, of water. But there's also this um, at the end of the film, you more or less kind of give it some uh, context in terms of real life situations where dams or reservoirs are built and how it actually impacts um, communities and people. Not just the not just the land and the the plants and the animals, and here on Seneca territory, um, we've we had a similar circumstance with um, with the Kanzua Dam, which was built in the 1960s by the Army Corps of Engineer. Uh, it had flooded 10,000 ancestral uh, homelands. Uh, communities had to be moved to higher ground. Uh, graveyards, cemeteries had to be moved to higher ground. So it was a really disruptive. Uh, period of our time and it's actually there are people who are alive then uh, that are here now and their memories are their stories are more memories where I feel like in your film uh, fairy tale of fairy tales of water um, maybe eventually the when there's no more memories uh, to keep it alive on um, these um, these tales or stories uh, which embody these um, um, these um, circumstances of, of displacement uh, people displacement, per water displacement. So um, if you want to take some time to to give some more context into your film before we compare and contrast. Yes, sure. Um, well, I mean, first of all, I'll, I'll come back to the, um, the, the the flooding issue. But um, mm -hmm. first of all, we were commissioned to make the film by WOW, Wales One World International Film Festival. Um, we did it fairly quickly and we, we pulled it together through a series of short films that we've been making for well as jake says seven eight years now um some to commission some just from our own our own passion and our own interest in our community and our landscape and and, and everything around us here is based around the idea of water we're um Jake lives on the Tavy River I live on the Raydal and the Uswith rivers uh, and we look out across the sea everything including most of ourselves, is is about water. Um, and it's so fundamental not to our entire beings, I, I would say. Um, so it was it was very easy to piece 
the little elements of the film together and to add in a few extra elements, which I, I think were from my travels, travels around the world and the various groups of native people that I've met over the years and seeing what their relationship to water is and beginning to understand that going back, e even only as far as 50, 60 years, um, there were people living here who only spoke the Welsh language. They didn't speak English and they had a, a very different relationship with the landscape and uh, the, the area and with water than I think we have now. And there, there are these lovely stories that people, many people didn't actually have names to the rivers or the sea. It was simply called, they would call all, ri all rivers Avon. Avon is the Welsh name for river. Uh, they would call the sea Amor, just the sea. Well, not the Irish Sea, not the Cardigan Bay, which is what we would call it now. Uh, oh, and all the rivers have names, but they were just known by the simple statement Avon. Um, one of the, 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 the most fundamental event from the past uh, that has happened around water, first of all, it began the earliest records go back to about 1881 when there was a, a valley uh, in Vernui in Powys, which was flooded and the village was evacuated and people were moved out. It happened again then at the Ellen Valley shortly afterwards. That's not far from where I'm living now. So this has a long history, but it all came to a head in 1965, which extraordinarily, as I discovered from our correspondence, was exactly the same year that the events happened at the Kinswood Dam, which, which I almost dropped sideways when I heard this. I, I do love, I, I know every single country is unique and different, but when you find these little connections, painful ones, albeit, you know, that suddenly my eyes kind of glazed open at this point, because we had a similar kind of story here, which was a, a, a village called Capel Kellin, was the entire village were evacuated, they were evacuated, they were evicted from their homes and uh, relocated further down the Tuwerin Valley in order to build a reservoir, which was where the, so the water could be funneled to the city of Liverpool, which was a good few miles away. Um, so there was not only the issue of the evacuation of people, um, people being removed from their homes, young children. Um, it, it's astonishing now when you read the memories of the people who were even just two, three years of age, as well as the school children. These people are now in their 60s, 70s, and they remember. They remember everything, and it's that sense of the, the shock that you don't, you don't own anything you know you can be evicted from the thing the place you know and the place you love and it can happen just like that um i'm, I'm quite lucky i was i was alive at that time myself we were living uh, further north in north way a little bit further north and west um and i don't i wasn't old enough to remember everything but i remember very strongly my father's feelings about it and the way he couldn't he couldn't keep from talking about it. There were two big issues going on at the time. The other one was a bit closer to us, where they were trying to build, well, they did build a nuclear power station at a place called Trousmanith. And the two things were intricately connected. And there were many people protesting about both. I, I, was, I was reading, there was one lady at Capel Kellin who said, who says now looking back, she doesn't think that the people protested enough. Now, she was only a young girl when this happened. And it's possibly true. They marched through Liverpool uh, to protest there. And they got quite a lot of abuse um, when they were marching. And it, it's hard to understand that now. Um, but that, that's it in a, in a rough nutshell. I mean, you can't explain the emotions and the feelings of people who are, are removed from their homes. And the whole situation, I gather, at Kinsua Dam was, was even far worse than this. But, um, I mean, maybe you'd like to talk a little bit about that, Terry, so we can just begin to piece, to thread things together. 
Yeah, I um I watched uh, you sent me a YouTube link to the uh Capital Callen uh the the 1965 uh it was in color which i thought was great because uh land of our ancestors is the film that we're referring to the documentary uh that the seneca nation i think commissioned a non-native uh to document this this important period in our in our history and it's funny that you know you had mentioned that somebody um they you mentioned that they they didn't know what they were going through at that time the importance of it and i've heard that from um an elder here who said who um, I think I recorded him every year in September, we have um, a, rec a day of recognition. It's called Remember the Removal. And it's right in the um, exact same um, area that the, the floodplain um, had, had occurred. And um, he, he recounts as some, um, um, when he was a kid, he recounts now that had he known what was going on then, he would have cried harder. And not just for the, you know, the human loss, but also for the plants and the animals and just the disruption of, of, of that is really what it can come down to is balance. There's a, there's a balance. Um, you know, we don't own the land. We don't own the birds or the animals or the plants. We all live, harm, supposed to live harmoniously all together with respect. So, um, so to watch almost like, as you mentioned, it was almost like um, you can almost play the films side by side and you can see the, you know the you know the the buildings being vacated the 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 construction of just how massive the construction is and um and at that time you know sometimes we don't realize um what we're going through as we're in the moment it's only in hindsight and perspective that we can truly see it so you know it i'm sure with somebody viewing it right at that time in 1965 both films and i'm watching it now you, you have a completely different uh, perspective so. Yeah, I was. Um, uh, it, it did. It certainly took a long while here, but now um, it's it's something now that is defining a, an aspect of Welsh culture. Um, everybody knows about it. Everybody, even people who weren't concerned at the time, now you won't find anybody who doesn't know what happened to Trewerin and. We, we have just a, about halfway between where I live and where Jake lives. There's um, an old ruined house where the gable end kind of comes onto the main road. And back in, I think it was 1965 or maybe 66, someone came along and kind of painted it in a kind of brick red lime wash and then painted these huge white letters, Coviuch Drewerin, which means remember Truerian. So, you know, somebody at that time was taking that, you know, was thinking about the future and that people might forget this. Of course, we haven't. Mm -hmm. And every now and again, it gets defaced. It gets painted over. Somebody comes along trying to make another point. And it, it happened only just a year or two ago. You, you can guarantee within a day or two, somebody will have put it back. And it's nearly always young people. It, it's off, there was a group of students came up. I think they came from Cardiff and some came down from the north, from Bangor. And within a night or two, there it was back again. And, and I think this time they, they actually asked a, a good friend of mine, Ruth Jane Evans, uh, a very fine artist around here, to actually come and paint it even better. And it, it's looking beautiful at the moment. And we know that if anybody else dares to... Uh, um deface it again it'll come back it's not going to go mm -hmm. away so it's become very powerful in our culture now um it's be become a symbol of the, the the kind of push for wales being seen as a separate maybe as a separate nation um mm -hmm. and there is a real strong push for independence here at the moment and it's become tied in with that as well so mm -hmm. you know it, it's so pleasing that young people have picked up on this and this won't go away yeah I don't think that's um, the same with you yeah they these um remember the removal it's almost like a, a somber walk you know along the the um the banks of the flooded areas and um and the, you know it's from elders people who are actually have um, live memories of it and to the young kids so the kids are getting a context of like um something that happened in their history and that we you know we must not forget this doesn't really pertain to water, but we have sort of that situation here. Those when uh, the mem where live memories are gone, and you only have like storybooks. 
But um, growing up, we have we have this traditional soup, and it's made out of burnt Iroquois white corn. And I never knew why it was burnt. And then it could come to find out that in 1794, around that time, George Washington had, because uh, we, we were kind of against them, the Senecas, and they said, well, go there and burn down their villages. So they came and they, they burned down all of our villages, all of our crops. We ran into the woods. And when we came back, we had burnt corn. We had burnt cornfields. So what did we do? We made soup out of it. So now when I make that corn soup or when I make that soup and I'm with my um, nieces and nephews, you know, we tell them it's not only something that gives us nutrient, it's also something that embodies um, history and memory and something that that's not to be forgotten, but also the historical, you know, giving the historical context to it as well. So it's something more than just just a soup. It's actually something more profound than that. And, um, and it sounds like with the to me, the, the, your film with the fairy tales, it, it, it's sort of like in that way as well. There's these stories that, are, that, um, that, um, that capture a certain time and place. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I refer to it in the film as, the, um, as our postmodern um, creation myths. It, it feels like as a nation, it started again in 1965 although nobody knew it at the time but it, now it does feel like that and um obviously as a storyteller i do like i like interpreting the, the culture and our ideas and our dreams uh, through fairy tales because I, and uh, folk tales maybe um mm -hmm. we have a word called uh, which me it covers myths legends fairy tales folk tales conversation you know this you know chatting um, it's all the same thing here. And, and I do like the idea that we can interpret these extraordinary moments in our history um, through folk tales and stories. Um, yeah, Jake was actually, um, Jake was brought, brought up here. And um, I know we, we've, we've spoken many times, but I, I think, I mean, do you want to say something about you know your, your kind of early memories of this place as well it, it might put the whole thing in a very human perspective yeah okay well um yeah i mean i, I was born in aberystwyth where peter lives um and it was some 10 years after the capital kellin um incident um or yeah event and um yeah so i, I grew up just outside a little town sort of midway between us called newquay which is a coastal village, coastal town. Um, and uh, I, I lived in a little cottage that had a stream running just past. So I was thinking about my relationship with water when we were asked to, to come and talk this evening. Um, and I just started remembering that and the, how important that was and just what a, uh, an amazing part of my childhood it was to explore the stream, to walk upstream into the woods and, um, and encounter ruins that from other um other settlements sort of from a, another century um so the, there's this yeah there's this kind of um fascination with water i think in my psyche from that those childhood days and um and when i met peter some years ago um i met him in newquay and he was doing um, a storytelling event uh, telling fairy tales of those same areas which my childhood kind of explored so there was this amazing kind of layer of um of the magic and the mythologies of that area that were being triggered in my mem from my memories as well from my memories of those places um and it was a quite an extraordinary kind of feeling um to to have that that sort of insight of of that history i suppose of a uh, the the unseen the 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 meaning behind the um the natural world in a way these these myths that are that's that speak to us through um through fairy tales you know uh, yeah the the creatures and the i don't know the, the mythical creatures they're amazing and um yeah uh, sorry i don't know where i'm going with this <laughs> I'm <just laughs> <thread of it. laughs> um but yes i think then growing up in newquay it was at that point it was very much a fishing community and that's something that we've seen change quite dramatically over the last 30 years or more, um, is that fishing has dwindled now to uh, being one or two, you know, small fisher fishing in, uh, interests. Um, 
there's not there's nowhere near enough um, enough of that to sustain people um, and it's massive massive tourist area is what we have mm -hmm. we have this influx of visitors who all come for the water for the sea um, but it's a really different a really different place in the summer um, mm -hmm. And that's quite interesting as well. And I think what, what Peter was talking about, about the, the historical kind of event of, of uh, Drew Aaron and Covey of Tor Aaron and, and Capital Ted Kellen and all of that, the legacy of that is this tension with the visitors because the visitors are often from the areas which benefited from those events earlier in the century. So there is, there is a residual... Um, I, I hesitate to say animosity, but there is a difficulty there around that, um, which sometimes comes to the fore. And at the moment, we have a we have this um, this problem with house prices, and we're, we're currently experiencing a real crisis in housing and locals being unable to afford um, property locally um, and having to move elsewhere, which. Um, you know, it used to be economic migration that would drive people away. Well, it's not that necessarily now. They, they, people want to stay there. They have their livelihoods here, but they want to find, you know, they want to start their own home and finding that extremely difficult. Um, mm. But yeah, coming back to the ideas of water, I think um, the, yeah, what was I, gonna, what was I thinking about? The, the, the whole... The whole series of films that I've done with Peter have been really, um, really fascinating in in terms of engaging with the landscape in a different way for me. And um, I, 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 my history as a as a filmmaker um, comes from a very much a fine art perspective, where it was purely to document activities within a studio. Um, so I think the work I've done with Peter is the first time I really engaged with narrative filmmaking. Um, but interestingly, I had also been creating quite abstract films, often looking at water because it's such a it, the properties of water are so amazing. The reflective qualities and its its motion is is just mesmerizing. So, um, yeah, I, th I feel like I've, I've, I've chipped in now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, there is. Um... There was, there was a thing that you just made the thing that we'd all mentioned, and we saw it in both films in uh, Land of Our Ancestors and uh, um, in the, uh, the the YouTube video. What was it? Uh, Capel Capel Cabin um, was this idea of um, industry coming in, and um, I think there's um, a certain point where the people who are benefiting the most from the water have this disconnect about really what had happened. And there's this big selling point of like, look at, you know, of creating tourism that it's created that this backflow now is just created these pools of water are just creating this really beautiful uh, environment for people to come into. But, you know, it kind of loses its, um, its, its, you know, profound loss or, or the human and, and environmental detriment. And we're kind of seeing that now, even with, uh, with, uh, with the climate crisis, you know, the, the most industrialized countries are the ones that are doing the most detriment and the ones, the smaller uh, countries and smaller communities, you know, fishing communities are the ones that are really um, seeing the effects of it, where they, they, they had really no, you know, no footprint in terms of, of, of how that, um, how the, how the things are coming out. So I just think it's, you know, it, it, to me, it just felt, felt like, um, you know, when you're, when you're, as I said, you're talking about this devastation and this loss, and then all of a sudden it's like, but look at the tourism, look at the beauty, you know, show people walking around in the, in the areas. And it just, um, it feels kind of gross to me a little, a little bit, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think you put that very well, Terry. Um, <laughs> it, it's something I'd, I've, I've been writing about something else that was a result of Capel Kellin as well, back at that time when I was growing up. And the little industry we had around here, um, I, I should say we're not in the south where there was coal mines. Um, there was very little industry, but where I was uh, originally brought up, we had a slate quarry, and uh, sorry, a granite quarry. And that gave employment pretty much to everybody in the, in the village. And that closed, I can't, I think it was the late 50s, it closed. And again, 
you know, it put everybody out of work and there was nothing to replace the work. And I think people managed to find a way to exist, but their children growing up had nothing. There was nothing to be passed on to them. A tradition had been broken. There was nothing left there. And virtually everybody in those villages uh, at that time, they all left. They kind of did what I did, which was, you know, you're looking for something to do. We went to art college. Um, we, we crossed the border. Nearly all of us did. And, you know, some of us managed to make a living out of it at the time, um, much to our surprise and certainly the surprise of our parents. But, um, you know, some didn't. And many never came back. I mean, I, mean, I did come back to, to the village, but um, I, I think these things, the, the other out, offset of that was, of course, it was at the beginnings of people buying second homes. So people were buying up the cottages from the people who were leaving or you know, couldn't survive anymore. And it be, that suddenly there were empty houses throughout the winter uh, that people were buying them to live in during the summer. And of course, you can imagine the effect that this had on the people who'd lived there for generations and the people, the younger people who were growing up and couldn't afford a house, that we couldn't afford to live. And um, this is now, it, it's almost like these things go in a, they do this, don't they? They keep coming back again. It turns circle and constantly comes back. And it, it's been occurring to me this last year or so that we've gone back to what happened post-1965, where the, the only slight difference is that people... There are young people now who are trying to set up um, internet businesses. They're trying to work from here rather than being forced to leave. But as Jake says, so much of our, there's not places to live now. The, we, people, local people simply can't afford to actually live in their homes, in, in their home land anymore. Mm -hmm. so, I, I, can I tell, I, there's just one thing I wanted to ask you. I, I, was, I was really struck. You know, I sometimes think, the, the things I'm talking about are very, um, there are strong differences as well between what happened here and what happened in with the Seneca Nation. Um, because you were telling me this story that before the, the people moved when Kinsler Dam was about to be built, you burnt the home, you burnt your own homes down. Mm -hmm. So they, um, <clears throat> so I think um, the thing that's um, similar with, with both are, you know, eventually you're going to get a, an eviction date. You know, you have to vacate by this certain amount of time. And there is a, 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 a short film right now that's occurred, that's being produced or it's going to be finished this year by a Seneca filmmaker called Caleb Abrams. And not to get too complicated, but our territory is kind of split in two. So we have the one in the south. They're about 25 miles apart from one another. I'm in the northern part and the Kanzua Dam or the the Kanzua Dam isn't on the territory reservation. It's a little bit, but the after effects, the backflow is, is there. But he's doing a film called um, uh, How I Burnt My Cold Spring Home. And the main character in that film is Steve Gordon. And he recounts, I mentioned him his story earlier where he, would, he wished he would have cried louder. But he remembers as a young boy, rather than have the Army Corps of Engineers come and burn their houses down, they did it themselves. They would have rather had had it done that way, you know, sort of like that. You can't fire me. I quit, you know, sort of thing. So it's like, you're not going to tell us to leave and burn our house. We're going to do it ourselves. So, you know, that's literally burning, you know, these um, tragic memories into someone's um, into somebody's psyche. So it's going to be really interesting to um, to see the short film uh, play out. I think it's coming in 2022. Mm. You see, that didn't that didn't happen here. Now that might be something to do with chapel upbringings. People were brought up um, through the chapel to be peaceful, and it, it just wouldn't occur. I don't yeah. think it would have occurred to people. What what did happen though was um, again the younger people who were feeling incredibly frustrated at that time. Also, there was a strong feeling the language was dying out, and there was a handful of cases of. Um, some of the old cottages that had been left empty and maybe were being bought up by people coming in. There were a handful of people going around 
setting fire to them. They were, they were I have to mm. say, they were incredibly careful. They were, they were, they were desperately tried to ensure there was nobody in them before they did anything. But mm. um, so there was, there was some setting fire, but it wasn't to their own homes in that sense. But it, it was a statement about a, a statement to say we cannot afford to live in our own land anymore. Uh, or in the land, you know, that we've been brought up in. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that has, um, in some ways, with um, with Steve Gordon's uh, story, it almost is a, an act of uh, uh, protest. Um, because when you think about it, at that point in time, they really had no choice. And the only one choice they did have was to do that. I mean, well, I mean, it was going to be burned or knocked down anyway into rubble. So, um you know, and then it was maybe on their end to feel like we're in control. This is the one thing that we're in control in. Um, yeah. That must have been a very really powerful nice. moment. Is it, is it like, like you say, suddenly you, for a brief moment, they had control, didn't they? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. And, and there's, and in, and in our film, is, or in, not my film, uh, the Seneca Nation film, Land of Our Ancestors, it does recount how. Uh, there was also like a political aspect to it as well with the dam was um, that um, we, I guess the Seneca Nation had protested it and took it to court and it went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, no, you, the, the dam is going to be built. And um, I think there was a, either a lawyer for the Seneca Nation, they actually um, um, appear in front of uh, John F. Kennedy and, and ask them about it. But then John F. Kennedy says, oh, it's gone to the Supreme Court. There's nothing I can do. But um, there's a interview that I have with a former president of the Seneca Nation, uh, George Heron, and there he recounts that Kennedy that year, I think it was 61, 62, um, he, he um, didn't win by a lot. And so he, as part of um, winning Pennsylvania, because that's where the, the state south of us, um, where the Kanzua Dam is, uh, he owed a political favor to the governor there for the water rights. And so that's why when we were, you know, approached of whether, because it was supposed to be like, I think the, the lawyer said, you know, George Washington signed this treaty that, you know, we would, we would not be impeded upon. And, and that's when um, John F. Kennedy says, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do, but there was a backstory to it. So it's sort of like that thing with the tourism and industry it just sounds gross. It just sounds something that, you know, um, it's just like business as usual. Yeah, promises don't mean a great deal, do they? Because time passes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's all about um, the business, isn't it, ultimately? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It seems. But I um I also want to talk um one thing that um that I thought was funny, funny, but is this a term uh, you say that you're a cranky maker. And I <laughs> <laughs> and uh what I what I liked about it is as is it's in the film is uh telling stories. It's almost reminds me of like a a, a self-playing piano role. And how, you know, it, it kind of spools along and plays the, you know, plays these notes where the cranky is on the up is, you know, turned the other way. And the, the story and the images are, are scrolled across. And, you know, and I mentioned it yesterday, but I kind of made a, a, a joke to myself where I said I made a mistake. I and said it's kind of like hieroglyphics, but then I said hydroglyphics. So I'm like, oh, that's what it's kind of like. It's hydroglyphics. So. Well, that, that fits perfectly. Hydroglyphics. I like that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I, um, uh, I, I should probably explain. I, the majority, of, even though I've lived here virtually all my life, um, most of my family actually live in Appalachia, in West Virginia, North Carolina, and you know a little bit further south down the Allegheny, and then down the Monongahela. And um, I've been going there for most of my life, and that was where I first saw crankies being used. And I, I kind of remembered then that. An old school teacher of mine um, made them when I was very little, and because they sprung off a memory, and you know memories can be incredibly powerful when they they come back later on in life. And I just realised they were perfect accompaniment to storytelling. And um, you know, I mean, for people who you know, they, it's, this is a, a a wooden box like a big frame uh, with an a great long scroll you turn a handle and it moves and you sing a song you tell a story while it's it's happening basically it's filmmaking before they had electricity um i mean i guess you must uh, 
you, you will see that as well. And you're thinking about it in a very similar way. And and certainly when I start when I paint them, you know, you spread the scroll out. You get a great long room. Open do them outside, or um, we've got an old billiard hall in town here, and I often spread it across there. Um, and it's like making a storyboard. You know, you kind of draw pencil lines. First of all, you break it down into scenes and sequences. And it's it feels to me exactly like filmmaking. Um, and certainly animation, but, but quite possibly any kind any style of filmmaking as well. And I know since Jake and I started working together, um, uh, my thought processes that go into making a cranky are almost identical to the way I think about a film. Um I said, just while, I, while I've got onto that one, I, I'm really intrigued because I've watched a few of your uh, you, the segments of your films, Terry, and a, a couple of the complete films. And I'm, I am quite struck that your approach to filmmaking, I mean, visually now I'm talking about the imagery, is very close to Jake's. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm not sure how aware the two of you are of this, but, mm -hmm. you know, your, your focus on the natural world, you su we suddenly see water, we see the, and nature, we see the natural world, and then we see the, the, the story, the narrative unfolding as well. But I, th there was certainly one, I think it was in is it Scarlet, mm -hmm. um, where you see these shots of a table and the candles and the light. And that's so similar to a, a film we made called Blood Eye Dryan, um, The Talking Tree, where we were stopping in a, um, in a, what we call a bothy, a, a, an old now empty house up in the hills here. And we were filming up there. And, and we set up a scene extraordinarily similar to that. And mm -hmm. I, I just, I do see these links um, and maybe that's a, a visual thing that kind of crosses cultures, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's, some of it has to do with my, my training. My, I went to film school, um, graduated five years ago. But um, some of, it's funny, some of my uh, biggest influences is uh, Mike Lee from Eng you know, England who does, but the things that I love about him are, um, especially Secrets and Lies. There's a scene in one of our films called On Earth where we were running out of time to film and it was a father and son sitting at a table. And I'm like, oh, we're like, we, we're, we, my brother had to leave. He was playing the one part. And we are like, so what do we do? And I go, there's this scene in Secrets and Lies. It's all one take. It's the reveal scene between the mother and the daughter. And I said, and it's, and they said, maybe we can try that. And we did it. But um, it's Mike Lee and uh, Chantal Ackerman is another film filmmaker. They do very long takes. Uh, the action is more internal. The action in you and what I've learned doing my films is that, you know, you give the audience or you give the viewer even using elements of, um, of nature to reflect, to, to, to um, kind of in some ways identify with what's going on on screen, but also to, um, to maybe uh, have time to reflect. Because right now we live in an age where everything's fast. It's fast cuts, fast, fast, fast. You don't even have time to really process it. And with Scarlet, that was a collaborative project that I did with two uh, people, Indians, but India Indians, not American Indians. And that too was a uh, delivery is called almost partialism where we, um, and it sort of like goes back to the, the, um, the cranky roles. You sort of like, we would only show portions of, of a face, a portion of a body, portion of the scene and table. And you would tr hopefully get the viewer to piece that together. And the same thing with these cranky images, even though they're still images, you're activating them in your mind in some ways. You can kind of imagine like how how they would move. Um, but yeah, that those are my that's where I sort of like you get your film influences, but then how do you make it your own? Um, but I think naturally that's why I gravitate towards that. We and and same with Govin, we kind of like this idea of just slow takes, letting it and you know, things reveal itself. And um, you know, uh, with the um, with the drama coming more uh, is under the surface and not like blow up, blow up bombs and guns and war and all that. So, hmm. and I think I mean my approach and the the long shots that I tend to linger on are, are almost. I, I mean, I was I haven't attended film school. I I I studied painting and fine art. Mm -hmm. So um, so I'm coming at filmmaking from a. Of quite a different perspective, I guess, um, and I and I gather that these long extended shots aren't really what 
what you're meant to do in film a lot of the time. Although I think mm. it's become more more popular than it used to be. I think I think people are experimenting more and more with it. But as you say, I think it, I think you're right. It does give time for the audience to reflect a little bit and um, and sort of dig into what they're seeing some more and and just pay attention. Um, mm. And and we are confronted with moving images so much, and they are generally moving very quickly. Um, so the opportunity to slow things down and really look, really study an object or the nat or a natural environment in that mm -hmm. way is, um, I think, is really important. Um, certainly for me, and I think I, I do that myself. I walk every day and, and and spend time in nature. So I guess it's a it's a kind of parallel with that that it it's come into the filmmaking in that way. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's also um, an element that we haven't really discussed yet was um, this idea of, of language. Um, we, the Senecas, we had uh, an Indian residential boarding school here, which my parents went to. But in the school, um, the kids were more or less forcibly uh, forced to go to the school, but they, were, they weren't allowed to speak their native language or the Seneca language. And so we have a huge generation of, of loss of language. We only have, I think, when I started making films about 10 years ago, it was probably, we had about a hundred fluent speakers. Now we're down to, I think we're below 50. And um, I try to include uh, language as much as I can in my films because it, it, it actually adds another element of, um, I think in my short documentary, Soup for My Brother, I use my great grandfather's voice. He's giving the Thanksgiving address. And in that it, it more or less gives thanks to you know, the environment, the water, the wind, you know, the stars, the moon, the animals. And, um, but I use it, you know, used it to affect, um, but I was wondering as well, there's, um, you know, the Welsh language in your film as well. So it's, how do you, how do you approach that, including language and it's, identity? In, in our films, I mean, we tend to make our films, um, well, we, we've made, I mean, we're currently putting one of our films into, just into the Welsh language. Everything we do around the film is always bilingual um, and, and occasionally more languages as well, because, you know, the people speak many other languages around here now. Um, but we there's an acceptance now in Wales that everything, everything you do in public life is bilingual. You will find road signs, everything, shops, nearly That's always you will see both languages. And regardless of which language the film is in, we will do everything around that. All the titles um, will be in both languages. And we're a little bit, we are a little bit stubborn about this because people say, well, if you put Welsh in the film, it should be subtitled. And we don't do that. We're not, we, we like. The narrative to just continue and if it drifts into another language um i think we feel we can do it so that people can catch up with that as well um nearly all the stories that we feature in the films are all from the welsh language that they're, they're all a translation um i don't know if you know I, I mean i'm still a bit staggered about you know what, what's happened to the seneca language um we for a long long while there, there was um I've been doing some work, lot of research on the fairy tale collector called Myra Evans, who Jake was talking about. She lived in the same area where Jake was born and collected many stories. And she was teaching Welsh around about 1900, which was a time when you weren't allowed to speak Welsh or teach Welsh in any of the schools around here, even though many many of the people who lived there didn't speak English. They were only well speakers, but it wasn't, It was, there was an attempt to try and get rid of the language at that time by not teaching it through the schools. Now that carried on a long way. I, I don't think that it, there was, it was actually banned as such, but it just wasn't taught. And, you know, if you don't put the teachers, the educators in place to keep the language alive, of course, there's no other result than it would die out. And this was also tied in with everything that was happening in 1965, because there was a strong feeling at that point that the language was dying. As speakers, the number of speakers was falling. Um, there had been a thing called the, the Welsh Knot, which if a child spoke Welsh in a school, uh, they had a little board uh, with Welsh Knot. That means 
don't speak Welsh. You don't speak Welsh. And it was hung around their necks. And they carried on through the day at school with this, you know, this hanging around their neck. And if somebody else spoke Welsh, it was passed to the next <laughs> offender. Um, but what happened, again, this goes back, I think, to uh, Capital Kellyn, to the, the battle to stop the building of the nuclear power stations. That it was focused around the language, very strongly around the language. And it, it, it certainly did have an effect. A lot of that was also down to our um, becoming part of the European Union. Because we were then there with other very you know small countries, to use a, a paraphrase, um, rather than just being next to uh, England or, or part of the UK. And suddenly, then funding came in as well through the European Union, and that allowed the Welsh language to be supported. So that now, since then, and I'd probably say this only really started happening in the late 70s, 80s. Suddenly everything started to become bilingual, everything you would see in public life. And it's very powerful. It's still, as somebody who grew up in a time when that, that wasn't like this, where everything was English, um, to suddenly see both languages. Even now, I do take a step back and I, I look at a bilingual sign and I think, my God, that it wasn't like that when I was little. So something... You know, we managed to change something here. And I'm I'm very proud to say we managed to do it through mostly peaceful means as well. Um but I, I don't know what what's going to be the situation with the Seneca language then? What will what's likely to happen? Yeah, so what made what makes it complicated is that we our language was an oral language, so it wasn't written down. And what when it was written down. It was uh, all these different um, groups of Senecas were had their own like phonetic way of spelling things or how things were pronounced. And about 12 years ago, I started when I moved back to the reservation from New York City. I um, I'd lived there for a while. Um, I was uh, involved with a language revitalization school. And in there was uh, part of like translating uh, part of our, our, I don't like to use the word religion, it's our way of life, we're, we're the followers of the code of Handsome Lake. And he was a prophet from who was alive around the early 1800s. And what he more or less did was help, because um, our as we were being constricted more and more into um, smaller pieces of land, the, the, the individual dynamics, family dynamics, community dynamics, everything was changing. So he more or less um, uh, uh, told us this new way of life that we would be able to to exist, um, you know, within these con with these confi confines, and um, so so what we so what we did was um, there was this um, translation that was done like a hundred years ago, and it was done with a different a different alphabet than like an English alphabet. So what we did was we would gather ten different um, elders into a room on a Friday afternoon. Um, and I, my aspect of it was helping them with the technology. So I would, you know, set up the projector. Um, I would create a word document. Um, some, the, now that we have like more of a universal, uh, alphabet. So it's a matter of like using, uh, you know, an, an O with two dots makes like a on sound or a, an apostrophe makes a, a glottal sound where you stop it. So it'd be on would be two, you know, an O with two dots and a, and a, and, a, and an apostrophe. So, um, so in that aspect, that's, that's sort of what they were doing too. So then we would bring up a word and then there'd be this big discussion. So the Seneca language or indigenous languages tend to, you know, it's not like uh, the romance languages where you have an, an object or a, a noun, an object or a noun, a verb and an object. It's, it's more, uh, it's more profound and poetic. It's more contextual. And so it's very complicated. So, you know, we would bring up these, this word written 100 years ago, and then they'd say, I think what they're talking about here is X, Y, Z. Then how, how, is it, how is it correctly said? So then we'd have to find consensus within the elders, like how it was supposed to be said. So, the, but the nice thing about what's happening now with re, um, language uh, preservation is that it is being taught in, in schools as uh, it does uh, satisfy a, a foreign language requirement. So you can take Seneca language, uh, but there, there are younger um, ones that are coming up who are becoming more fluent. 
Um, I graduated from Syracuse University and they actually have a, a certificate program where the, the professor actually, um, there are uh, roots, there are similarities and roots with how the Haudenosaunee speak. And so he's able to, you know, winnow it down and use it. So then when you take this class, you can kind of speak um, the, the Seneca, you know, Onondaga, Mohawk, there are similarities in there. So you can come, come out of that program uh, understanding how to how to speak the language um you know and that too as well as like because we didn't have a written language we tended to uh you know it was a communal uh culmination of our of our histories personal histories uh tribe tribal histories but then also individual and same with the language so the language is uh something that um that we you know that we we you know, we're told as well in our in our teachings that there will be a point in time when we won't have our language. Um, it's just a matter now of how we how we preserve it. But I'm I'm hopeful. I am hopeful. There are younger ones who are who are gonna and there too now we see street signs that are in Seneca, you know, and, and so when you see it, you kind of pronounce it out. Mm. Um, and also <laughs> just and also just quick and also in terms of teaching. So when when you try to teach um, native kids, uh, Ling, um, try to teach them by reading and writing. That's something that's a new concept for us. We've only had it a couple generations, so I think it's um, you know where maybe that's why I, I I'm like filmmaking because it's more uh, more visual. It's more of using your sight and sound and not so much well it is zeros and ones. But anyway, yeah, I, I mean, there's there's so much that I, I it's just reminded me of something that. Um, the lady I spoke about before, this lady Myra Evans, who was a collector of, well, uh, she was seeing the Welsh language beginning to be pushed down. This is 120 years ago. And she set about collecting, gathering the stories, gathering the songs, writing them down. And you know, it's interesting what you were saying about the, you know, almost having to now make an oral language into a written language in order to allow it to survive because that's kind of what Myra was doing as well but she also hit hit upon this uh, amazing idea that it was the um at, at the root of the language were these old stories and these old folk tales and by uh, by she wrote them down in Welsh these were mostly oral tales at that time certainly where she lived OK, some of them had been written down. There was quite a big Welsh language writing culture in the 1800s. Um, but these stories of Myra certainly hadn't been. She was writing down an oral tradition. And um, clearly of the opinion that the old stories, if they were remembered and they were kept and they were retold in the native language, would be very powerful because those stories connected the past with the present and also they gave they gave them the gave us the knowledge about how to move forward into the future which to me is what these these old stories do and um I, I might pass over to you on this one Jake because what I'm coming to is there was one she gathered one remarkable story about a little boy who lived in exactly the same valley where Jake was brought up brought up this the story of Gitto and the Korach Kochbach, and, um, and this lovely imagery in that story, that this boy, he, he's picked on because he has one foot bigger than the other one, and he keeps, all, all the children laugh at him, and people, you know, he's different, so it's the old idea that you're different, you have to find a way to deal with the world around you, and he sits by the little stream, exactly where Jake was brought up, um, listening to the bird song, listening to the rattling sounds of the water as it crashes over the pebbles on its way down into the sea. And um, I mean, I think I'll, I'll pass over to you. I'm talking a lot here, Jay. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I like the idea that the fact that he, Jake and I are working together on this through Jake's ability to see the water and the landscape of when he was younger that he's now interpreting now and piecing it together with these old stories that I see as my mission to continue to tell. I don't know if you've got anything to add to this, Jake, have you? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, 
as I said earlier, I mean, it's been an amazing, it was an amazing experience having those memories triggered by fairy tales and, um, and, and the, or the stories, the folk tales rather, rather than fairy tales, but, um, yeah, it was it was quite extraordinary because the names of the places were uh, were embedded in my psyche and in my memories, um, but not for those reasons. So it suddenly had this layer of um, of other world of something magical there, which is what we what we do as children anyway. I was inventing things, but I had no idea that there were already this this layer of historic kind of um, folk tale and story embedded in that landscape as well so i think it's really interesting going back and looking at those landscapes and those areas in with it with adult eyes but with that knowledge as well um which is perhaps why we we've um why we've done some of the, the films we have around Newquay specifically although obviously that's that's the myra connection too um but i was interested in what you were saying about the language in wales obviously we we there was a strong feeling that we were about to lose it as mm. well i think and I think the that that Capel Kellen incident kind of galvanised uh, the na the Welsh nation in a way as this moment of uh, of clarity of what was happening and of something to sort of um, rally behind and and it it re and which is why it then became this iconic wall of graffiti which um, we have we have here in Cardigan we have um, a, a historic um, animal mart market and um and it closed down recently and now it has graffiti on it Kovyuch Mart Abatevi. So they're take and it's got the same framework, it's on a red background, same kind of style writing. Um so they're using that very iconic um sort of imagery as a as a symbol of, you know, let's not forget these industries, these um these things. And interestingly you could say earlier you you mentioned the, the changing industry in where you grew up, Peter, um, and here in Cardigan, 200 years ago, it was a thriving port town and it had a, a thriving slate industry that was exporting from here, that it was it was a few individuals' decision not to dredge the river that meant that they, they just couldn't get the new steamships in. So we had confidence that we would carry on with our tall, uh, you know, deep, Vessel, deep hold vessels coming up the river but the, it, it was you know, it couldn't happen it didn't happen and steamships were going to just be a, a passing phase we'd all be we'll all be back on the sailboat soon enough um but yeah that's um you know again it's like it's almost the, these things are imposed upon us and the the locals just are then left to deal with it um and and what did they do they moved actually they moved down to the south of um of wales and became miners and the mm -hmm. the cities that sprung up around the south kind of developed mm -hmm. from that migration um, but um yeah yeah no it's been extraordinary working with you peter over the years and and triggering these amazing <laughs> memories and the things that have come from that as well working with the musicians kerry and elsa that we do um some extraordinary kind of coincidences that I've discovered through filming with them and talking to them. It turns out that the property where I lived near Newquay was actually bought with a private mortgage from my parents, bought it from Elsa's grandfather um, in the 19, in the early 70s. So, um, but yeah, just these, these really odd little coincidences that occur and, and I love those in when I'm making some work and, and you just feel like you're in the right place and that those coincidences tell you that you're on the right track and it's uh, pieces of a puzzle just start sort of fitting together um, and that's kind of how it felt when I first heard those Myra tales it was like ah okay these landscapes now have this other layer and um, and, and it was also a fantastic way an excuse to revisit my childhood areas <laughs> and walk the same walk the same stream as it were and kind of follow yeah follow those footpaths again mm. Mm. so yeah. yeah i think we i think we should we never underestimate the power and strength of our old stories again going back to the 1960s um as part of the movement to try and uh, conserve well rescue the language to come to terms with a culture that had been um you know was literally being flooded quite literally by you know the the, the big out, outside world um 
we did turn at that time and certainly the younger people went back to their stories and this is where the stories of Owen Glyndour who was said to be the last Prince of Wales he was written out of the history books prior to that point but they discovered a genuine historical figure about whom there are countless folk tales fairy tales which may or may not be true we also reinvented or went back to a figure called Santes Doinwen, uh, Saint Doinwen. Uh, now, she, there was no stories about her beforehand, but they were discovered. And she became, and I really love this, she became the patron saint of lovers in Wales. So we, we got rid of, um, you know, all, all, all the others who had been brought into the culture um, and, you know, val Valentine and all that kind of thing. And we celebrate Saint Doin Wednesday. Did Santa Stoys win on the 25th of January every single year? Now, that's only been going since the 1960s. And it's part of that reinvention of the culture yeah, yeah. out of adversity, out of these mm. extraordinary attempts to kind of keep the culture down uh, and the language. And we did turn to our fairy tales and our folk tales and our myths and our stories. And I think it's really important that we, you know, never forget our myths. And I do see this happening in other, uh, in other places, but to me, it's really important that we hold on to these stories. They're important for telling us how to deal with the future. So um, <clears throat> probably can be, start to wrap up our conversation. I wish we could just talk forever. <laughs> <laughs> so many, so many interesting things. Um, but let's um, let's uh, finish up by um, just explaining like what are you guys working on next? Are there any collaborations or any um, films or books or whatever coming up? Well, we're um, we're, we're, we're currently uh, we're working on a commission uh, uh, that we had some time ago, just before um, the the COVID kind of crisis hit. Uh, we, we had a commission through um, uh, at the University of Aberystwyth to make a film about the uh, the Fishguard port, which is where the ferries leave to go to Ireland. Um, so it's around the, the journeys and the, the to and fro of the stories about that journey um, and the, the, I guess the the exchange of um, of those stories between Ireland and Wales and, and specifically around the Fishguard area. So, um, so there's that one, uh, which we're hoping to get into the edit very soon. <laughs> <laughs> but we've been saying that for a while. It's been a difficult year, this last one, to get out and interview people in particular. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, we, we're getting there, aren't we? We are. Yeah, yeah. Interestingly, our approach to this, this, this film we're about to do the editing on is um, some of the things we've been talking about. We're... we're um, we're, we're not going to have a narrative voice to it. We, we've been interviewing people, talking to people who um, use the ferries, live in that, lim that, that space, that liminal space, and work in that space. So we, we've broken it into little sections of other people's voices. And then I think long shots, we're going to be doing um, long shots over the water, um, with the music of Kerry and Elsa, who we work with on all our films. Um, and we're going to see if that works all the way through, cutting it from, you know, one set of talking voices, long shots with music, water, then back to voices again. And we'll repeat that through the film. It's just a, a slightly different way of working again. But, um, uh yeah, well, we're going to see how it comes out. <laughs> We've got some very promising material, and we had a, a yeah. fantastic um, kind of sound recording weekend uh, a couple of weeks ago with Kerry and Elsa, and it, they're amazing musicians, and they do this fantastic kind of researching old folk songs mm. and re-scoring them sometimes. If they, they, they find manuscripts that don't have score and marry them with score of the same period, it's, it's, they're extraordinary. Really beautiful musicians. Yeah. Just be, before we um, finish up, Terry, can I uh, can I just say a huge thank you to you 
Um, you've certainly opened my eyes to many things during our brief acquaintance. And it's, it's been a great honour meeting you and to Tweed for uh, organising the festival. I know it's incredibly hard work and for being kind enough to invite us to show our film as part of this. Um, uh, so th thank you both of you. And, and also a very special thank you to Rowan and David at Wales One World International Film Festival to WOW, because probably we wouldn't be sitting here now, but for them. So thank you all of you. Yeah, yeah thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, it's been it's a great um, opportunity to use um, virtual, you know, vir um, to meet virtually to share these, um, share our insights and experiences and and I, I mentioned, I think yesterday when we spoke briefly, Peter, that um, I view it sometimes that the contents of our lives may be different, but there are many uh, universal um, processes that that can unite us and bind us. And storytelling is one of them. We can, we, um, you know, we as long as our characters and our stories are relatable and universal, um, you know, I would say like it's sort of like with you know being an indigenous filmmaker it's not that we have a different way of storytelling we tell stories the same way it's just that i i come my films are kind of like different colored paints they're just some um, that people aren't used to seeing so i may be talking about love or loss or something but i'm saying it in a in a way painted in a different way that maybe it'll resonate with um with the uh, with the casual viewer in a more profound way than you know a hollywood blockbuster where we kind of know world in peril and man saves the day and um, yeah, so uh, yeah, thank you so much for taking this time to, um, to have a chat and good luck on your future, future projects. It's a pleasure. Look forward to meeting you again. Yep, me too.